psalmist says, <clears throat> excuse me, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Today as we gather together, we pray God's blessing to be upon us, upon us as we hear the word of God, upon us as we sing, upon us as we pray, that God's Holy Spirit will envelop each and every one of us today and that God's presence will be with us. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord, that we come now, Lord, to the reading of your word and the proclamation of the gospel. Lord, we know, Father, that you are present with us in good times and in bad times. We know, Lord, that you are with us when we are in church or elsewhere. But, Lord, especially be with us in this hour, that your Holy Spirit might indwell each and every one of us, and that the words that are read from your holy word and the words that are spoken through this unworthy preacher, Lord, may each and every one of us go forth from this place knowing that we have done business with God today and that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, walks with us through everything that we do and everything that we say and everything that we think. We ask this in his wonderful and in his everlasting name. Amen. Now, would you please turn to the 22nd chapter of the book of Matthew, Matthew 22, uh, beginning at the 15th verse. And we're going to read uh, a short passage of scripture today. And this uh, passage of scripture, I think, is very important for each and every one of us as Christians, because as we read it, we need to remember that we are Jesus Christ's brothers and sisters, God's sons and daughters, but we also live in the world, and so it's important that we understand that. So let us hear the word of God now, as recorded in Matthew's Gospel, found on page 979 in your pew Bible. And if you would like to, you may read it with me. Then the Pharisees went out, and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. Then they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And those inscription. Caesar replied, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. May he inscribe it upon our hearts this day and always. I wonder how many of you ever have weird thoughts that come into your mind. You know, sometimes I have the weirdest things come into my mind, and I think, Lord, where did that come from? And I thought to myself this morning as I got up and uh, uh, went into the restroom and was getting myself ready for church, I wondered to myself, what would the people think of me if I decided not to comb my hair? If I decided not to brush my teeth? If I decided not to have a shower? If I decided not to address myself? If I just showed up and smelled and looked terrible and had bed head and bad breath and all of those things, I wonder what the people would think about me. And I thought to myself, you know something? I would never do that. And the reason I would never do that, because I believe that we need to honor God every day as we live upon the face of the earth. When we go out from our homes, we need to be Christians who honor God, not just for one hour here on Sunday morning, not all polished up and beautiful and handsome, 
Not all holier than thou. Women, you have on your beautiful makeup and your hair is done beautiful. You handsome guys, you properly shaved or trimmed your beard or, and you were all ready to go. We're all here today, all polished up to be in the house of the Lord. But what happens when you step outside the church? Do things change? Our heart today as we are here is for the Lord. We know that God loves us with a special and abiding love. We know that he has a plan for our lives. It's a plan for good and not a plan for evil. A plan to prosper us. We know that the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit is present in this place as we worship and as we sing and as we pray and as we read and as we hear the word of God. We know the power of God is here. We know that the Holy Spirit descends as a dove upon each and every one of us and we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit when we, as his children, as his sons and daughters, come into his presence to worship. I said to my wife before uh, I came out this morning, I said, you know, Sunday is my favorite day. Whether I'm preaching or whether I'm sitting in the congregation listening to another pastor bring forth the word of God. It's my favorite day because I love to be in the presence of the living God. I love to be there when people are praying. I love to be there when we hear the singing of, of your beautiful choir. I love to be here when the prayers are offered to Almighty God. I love to be here just to sit in the presence of God. And so do you. But what happens when we go out this door? We're drinking our coffee or having our juice or filling ourselves with those calorie-free goodies that you bring every Sunday morning. And then what happens when we leave the door of the church and go to our car? And what if we travel down Cheese Factory Road out onto 64 and, and we're going along and somebody cuts us off? Do you say, praise the Lord? <laughs> or do you give that person a certain sign or say something that you know you shouldn't say? And what about when you go to work? Do you carry Jesus with you when you go outside this building? Do you carry him with you wherever you are? Last week I spoke to you about personal holiness. I spoke to you about each and every one of us needing to walk in the ways of the master, to live holy lives acceptable to God, to follow this beautiful book that God has given to us that we may live righteous lives, upstanding lives, lives that honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know that as Christian people, we all have times of prayer. If you have a significant other, maybe you have prayers with that person. Or maybe you go into the prayer closet by yourself and, and lift to God those prayers that are, are deep within your heart, within your mind, within your soul, and you pour it out to God, asking God to hear and to answer your prayers. And maybe you have a place where you open God's word and you read the beautiful Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence does my help come. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And he will wipe away all the tears from your eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning nor crying nor pain for the former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. That's wonderful. But what do you do when you go home? I think most of us will, first of all, take off our Sunday clothes. And we'll get into a pair of shorts in the summertime. And I got this old shirt I was telling you about last week that, uh, that my wife is threatening to throw out. 
And she did throw it out this week, and I went and got it out of the, out of the garbage. <laughs> Put it in the laundry basket again to be washed. And she said, you took that out of the garbage. I said, yes. Because why? It's an old friend, and it's tattered and torn, and it had a picture on the front of it of my son John uh, when he was younger, and he was sticking his tongue out at me. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> That's something you don't want to wear around, but it's something that I cherished. But what do you do when you go out of here? Do you continue to be a Christian? And I want to share with you, just speaking for a few moments, how you need to carry with you the love of Jesus Christ wherever you are in the world. And first of all, I want to say this. First of all, you need to be a witness to your family. Now, whether you are a family of one or a family of 25, it makes no difference. But when we need to carry Jesus Christ into our homes, into that place where we have the most intimate relationships with a spouse, with a husband, with a wife, with children, with grandparents, with uncles and aunts. You need to be a witness as you go out and and let them know that you are a Christian. You know, they say that uh, there's one place where you can be yourself, and that's with your family. And sometimes our families know us too well, don't they? But you know something? If we are witnesses of Jesus in our own household, it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing to to watch your children as they grow in the faith. When I was a young boy, because my mother and father had been divorced, we went to live with my grandparents. And my grandparents were people of faith. Every morning, And every night, I saw them on their knees, praying to God. When I would come home from school, my grandmother would be sitting in her chair, reading the word of God. When we sat down to dinner, we always gave thanks to God. On Sunday morning, we all got up and went to church. Nothing kept us from going to church. And you know... That implanted something in my heart. They didn't speak to me too much about the Lord, but they demonstrated it through their love for me and for our family. And just that young boy watching them kneeling before the Lord touched my heart, and I've never forgotten it. And what about your home? Is your home a place of prayer? Or is it a place of conflict? I can remember many years ago, I was going to uh, uh, visit a a new family in our congregation. And I came up to the door and I uh, was just about to knock on the door when I could hear the husband and wife having a really drag out fight. Now, don't put up your hand, but how many husbands and wives here have had a fight? Now, don't put up your hands, but I would think most of you. They were having a drag-out fight, and, and, and the language wasn't very good even. And so I stepped back, and I thought, I'll wait till it dies down a bit. But it didn't die down. It kept on and on and on and on, because I was early. But toward the time I was supposed to arrive, it, it kind of petered off. Well, I went inside, and uh, there they were, the husband and the wife, and they were all smiles, and they said, Pastor, come and sit in that chair, and they sat together on the couch, and they held hands, and, and, and I thought to myself, you know, they want to show me that they're good Christians. Now, I don't know what the fight was about, and sometimes we do let our tempers get away from us, Or sometimes one or the other is unreasonable. 
or sometimes the one or the other has done something that they shouldn't have done, and it's caused conflict. And that's part of life, isn't it? Many of us do have times when we get angry. We get angry and we get upset, and then the old saying is that we hurt the ones we love first. But our homes need to be a sanctuary of God's love. And when we get into situations in our homes where there is conflict, that is the time when we need to realize that that Christ is still in our home. He's still there with us. He still loves us and cares for us. And he wants our homes to be places of peace. We know today that in our world, the home is in trouble. We know that all across our land and all around the world, families are being destroyed. But as Christian people, we need to be sure that our homes are sanctuaries of God's love. Irregardless of the little times when we disagree, irregardless of the times when our children are disobedient, irregardless of the times when we don't feel very holy. I'm very fortunate because I can go home to a holy place. My wife is also a Methodist pastor. Now sometimes I go home and uh, I've gone out to pick up something at the supermarket and come back two hours later and she's a little upset with me. But you know something? I know that even when she's upset with me or I'm upset with her, that's going to be okay because Jesus lives in our home. So first of all, we need to be very, very careful that we are Christians in our own home. The Bible says, according, train up your children in the way they should go and when they're older, they're not depart from it. It's important that you read the Bible to your children. That you demonstrate prayer. That you show them how to forgive when when conflict comes. And that you instill in them the morality that Jesus wants us to walk in. That we are to be a holy and acceptable people to God. And it begins with our family. And then also, what about our place of work? Sometimes it's tough to be at work. Sometimes the language is pretty bad. Sometimes you've got a boss who's just terrible. Sometimes you're doing a job you don't want to do, but you have to do it because you've got to eat. Sometimes you get up in the morning and you think, oh, do I have to go into work today? Couldn't I just stay in bed or phone in and tell the boss that I'm sick and I I don't want to go? And what if he's overbearing? What if he's one of these managers that micromanages everything and drives you nuts? When I was in uh, the bank before God called me to the ministry, I had this one manager, and he drove me nuts. I was a manager of a a certain section of the head office of of, of a major bank in in Canada, and he was over me. And you know something? He would come in and and nitpick and nitpick and nitpick and nitpick until every time I saw him coming, I wanted to run out the door. But you know something? I didn't. And I didn't. Why? Because I knew that God had placed me under his authority. And whether or not I liked him, whether or not I hated him, whether or not I I, I really didn't want to take his advice, God had placed me there. And that I was to do the best job that I could possibly do to honor God. 
When I was working that same place, there was the need to have a, a head of the data input section. And there were two young women who had done exceptional work, and I looked at them. And I had to choose one of them, and I chose one of them, and the other one came to me very upset. Why didn't you choose me? And I said, you know, you two are on equal footing. But there was one difference. She came in on time every day, and you were late all the time. When you go to work, do you do your work to the glory of God? When you're sitting at your desk or working in your factory or working outside, are you doing it to God's glory? Are you happy in your work? Are you smiling and saying, Lord, you've given me this job in order that I might work and live and, and, and raise my family and, and, and give my tithes to the church? Or are you one of those grumpy people who comes in and sits at your desk and mumbles all through the day? And That's a terrible witness to our Lord, isn't it? You see, it's easy to be a Christian when we're sitting here in the church. Because we're all here and we're all Christians. And we all love to do the singing and all that. But when we get out there into the world that's torn apart with so much sin, so much pain, so much suffering, murder and rape and so many other things going on out there, it's hard to be a Christian. You say, well, pastor, you don't know much about the outside world because you've been in the church for so many years. But let me tell you, some of the things that I've seen and some of the things that I know would curl your hair. Some of the people who have come into my office for counseling, you wouldn't believe they lived in Christian homes, that they worked in Christian environments, that they lived in a Christian country. You just wouldn't believe it. So first of all, we need to be very careful in our homes that we show Christian love and that we teach it to our children and that when trouble comes that we have a sense of forgiveness. Because remember what Jesus did when he died on that cross 2,000 years ago? Do you remember what he did as he hung upon that cross? His feet not on the earth and his glory not yet in heaven. He forgave us all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. All of us sin. All of us separate ourselves from God. All of us make a mess in our lives at one time or another. And I've made lots of them. But when I think of what Jesus went through, I think, Lord, whatever I go through is nothing compared to what the Savior did. Because not only did he suffer physically, not only did he suffer mentally because all of his disciples ran away, but he suffered spiritually because upon his head came all the sins of the world. And as he hung upon that cross all by himself, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he bowed his head and he died. I can also remember a time when my, my grandfather, Fred Moore, together with his brother, started Benjamin Moore Paints, and he was president in Canada. And I went with him once, and he was president of the company. He had his office way up on the top of the building and way down where they were making the paint and everything. And when I was a kid, I used to go in there, and I used to put the lids on the cans and other things. But the one thing that struck me was this that my grandfather went to work with a shirt and a tie on, always dressed, always clean, always ready. 
but he went as a Christian. And before he began his work that day, he had overalls in his office. He put his overalls on and he went downstairs and he talked. He talked to the janitor and the one who did the mixing and the one who did the tinting and the one who did the hewing and the one, and, and he knew them. He knew them by name, he knew their wives, he knew their children, he knew everything about them. And I said, Pop, I said, why do you do that? He said to me, because I love my people. And you know something? Throughout all his life, I never saw him utter an angry word. I never saw him do anything wrong. He demonstrated his love for Jesus. And what about the young people who go to school? Now, we know when the kids go to school today that they're not allowed to read the Bible. They're not allowed to pray unless you go to a Christian school. You're not allowed to, to spend time even having a Bible study. It's all been stripped away. It's been stripped away because we Christians have not demanded that our faith be upheld even in the government circles. We have been silent as the ACLU came forth and stripped away the monuments from in front of courthouses. We've been silent as our schools have been stripped of anything that has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been silent because we're afraid of offending someone of another faith. But how does a young Christian deal with these things in school? Once again, because you are unable to, to actually say something, you can do it by example. If some kids want to go and do drugs, you say, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian, I don't do drugs. If you want to go to a wild party when all sorts of things are going on, you say, I'm sorry, but I belong to Jesus and I won't go. If the kids say, well, let's go down to the store and get some beer, you say, I'm sorry, but I belong to Almighty God, and He is my Lord, and He is my Savior, and He is the one who made me, and He is the one that I'm going to honor. And by your example of refusing to go to a certain place or do a certain thing, you are honoring Jesus and being a witness of Him. Are some of these words harsh today? Or am I telling you the truth? As I said last week, whenever I speak these words, I speak it to you, but I speak it to myself also. Because I know that I have failed also in many, many different ways. Young people, when you're in school, continually walk in the ways of the Master. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light and glory of his face. I always get that last, <laughs> last line wrong. But one of the most wonderful things is that we as Christians can also be examples in our community. What about our neighbors? Are you one of these people who put up a big fence because you can't stand the neighbor? Or what if you're at the supermarkets at Tops or at Wegmans or at, at, at Wade's or, or one of the other supermarkets and you, you look down the aisle and you see somebody coming, oh no, not that, no, oh, not her. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't want to stop and talk to her. Yeah, I can't stand that woman. So you zip around the next aisle and hope you don't run into them. But you know something? 
Paul said it best. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but have not love, I am as a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Do you know something? You don't have to like everybody. Not everybody likes me, I know that. But because you're a Christian, even if you don't like them, we're called to love them. What does Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and, not or or but, but and, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What have you done for your neighbor lately? I'm lucky. I have two sets of wonderful neighbors on either side. On one side, I have two ladies. On the other side, I have a husband and wife. And we do for each other. Because I'm retired, I keep an eye on their homes when uh, they're out to work. And when the garbage comes, I, I bring the pails in for them and put them in their garages. And uh, once in a while, uh, uh, the ladies next door will come over and bring us something uh, nice, and, and uh, like a pie or a cake or something like that. And the fellow next door, because he knows that I have congestive heart failure and I can't do snow, he shovels my snow all winter long. And when I offer him money, he refuses it. See, that shows love, doesn't it? Love overcomes a lot of things. You may say, well, pastor, it's really tough being out there today. It's really tough. Some of the theologians say we're in a post-Christian era. I don't believe it. This week I was deeply saddened. As many of you know, I am a a fire chaplain. And at 3.03 on Tuesday morning, a.m., I was awakened as I got toned out with my pager. And it said, alarm at the firehouse on County Road 14 in Ionia. Now normally I don't pay any attention to those because we get a lot of false alarms. But then it said, multiple alarms coming from the building. And I thought, that doesn't sound good. And then it said, smoke inside the building. And then I knew it was time to go. I got out of my bed and threw my clothes on and ran downstairs and jumped into my turnout gear and drove out. And when I arrived, the smoke was pouring from the building and the flames were beginning beginning to lick out uh, out the ports and out out the vents and, and up through the ceiling. And I stood there while it began to fall apart. But you know something? I was amazed. Because those firefighters from my own you arrived. The first thing they did is they ran in and they got the, the, the trucks out, all four trucks out. And they got a lot of the turnout gear out. And then when you heard the sound of the horn, that meant that you couldn't stay in the building anymore because it was dangerous, it was going to collapse, and they all came out and fought the fire from outside. And you know, they did their job in spite of the feelings. Some of them had been a member there 60 years, and yet that man jumped on his pumper and ran the pumper in order that the water could be delivered to put the fire out. And that's what we need to do, don't we? We need to remember that even though we are Living in this world, we're not of this world. We're like a ship on the sea. We're like a ship that travels along the top of the sea. We're not in the sea, but we're on top of the sea. And we as God's children need to remember that we need to do our best for the Lord Jesus Christ as we are in the world. Remember, greater is he who is in 
What? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. See, we walk with the Master, and the Master's with us and loves us. His Holy Spirit comes upon us and blesses us in a very special and wonderful way. So today, I challenge you. I challenge you to be the people that you are right now sitting here in this place. I challenge you in your home, in your school, in your place of work, in your community, in your nation, to be an example of Jesus. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, therefore go into all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. James said this, faith without works is dead. So today I challenge you, as you await the coming of your new pastor, to be in prayer daily for that individual who we do not know who it is yet. Be in prayer in your home. Be in prayer in your school. Be in prayer in your place of work. Be in prayer in your community. And ask God, to make you an example of who Jesus wants you to be as you live out your life here upon the earth. One thing that I always remember, I watched a preacher on television once, and he said to me, he said, you know, as he spoke the words, he took a, a wooden cross said, remember, whatever you do, if it is not according to the will of God, you're walking over the top of the cross. For the cross is the symbol of God's love for us. It's a plus sign. It's a plus sign that each and every one of us, as God's children, as God's sons, as God's daughters, that we belong to him. And that God with us always. Today, I may finish this sermon fairly soon so you can get outside and enjoy this day. But remember as you go out that you're carrying Jesus with you. Don't dishonor him but be a witness for him wherever you go, whatever you do, and whatever you think. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day, for the blessings, Lord, that you have given to us. Father, sometimes we forget, Lord, uh, when we finish worship, that, that we need to walk with you every day, to be examples of our love for Jesus and in, in the presence of others. Help us, Lord, to do this, Lord, to be obedient to you and to trust in you that even in situations where, where Jesus is hated, Lord, that we can indeed trust and obey you and that we can be witnesses of your son Jesus wherever we go. So thank you, Father, for this time together, for this time of knowing that you walk with us within the church and wherever we go. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.